straight ahead on Law and Crime. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. A woman convicted of stabbing her husband 193 times is now out of prison. Law and Crime's Jesse Weber has more on the trial of Susan Wright. The Texas woman who was convicted of tying her naked husband to the bed and stabbing him to death was just released from prison. A jury found Susan Wright guilty of the 2003 murder of her husband, Jeff, and after serving 16 years behind bars, she was granted parole this past summer. True crime fans may remember her 2004 trial, including the moment the state reenacted the vicious killing on a bed. She originally got 25 years in prison, then she was granted a new sentence of 20 years after it was determined her attorneys provided ineffective assistance. As part of her release, she'll be under the super intensive supervision program and will be required to check in until 2024. For Law and Crime, I'm Jesse Weber. Joining me now is attorney Dina Dahl along with Terry Austin. Dina, Susan Wright is being released after about 16 years, but as you heard, still going to have super intensive parole for about three and a half years, wear an ankle bracelet and also do anger management. Thoughts on the conclusion of this saga? You know, it, some people might wonder why she's getting out so early. But parole is commonly like an in-between step between incarceration and freedom to society. And like you said, she's going to have be monitored. She has four years while she's going to be on parole. She's going to have intensive anger management counseling. She'll be supervised. She won't be. Able, she'll be monitored with this ankle bracelet. It may give a chance for her to be rehabilitated in a way that when she does enter society freely in four years, we're hoping that she will be no longer a menace to society. Now, Terry, 193 stabs in a failed self-defense argument. What's your take on Wright being released to parole? You know, I think that 16 years is not nearly enough for such a brutal and heinous crime. You know, under Texas law, she could have received life in prison. Instead, you know, she got 25 years, which was ultimately reduced on appeal. And, you know, I think that it is an injustice for the family who, you know, have now no father. So I, there are two children involved here. So I think it's a really bad outcome. Absolutely. Obviously, keep eyes on how her parole is going. The Justice Department officially closes the investigation into the shooting death of Tamir Rice by Cleveland police without filing charges. Anjanette Levy spoke with the attorney for Rice's family about this development. This news was not completely unexpected, as it had been reported previously by The New York Times and The Washington Post. But it was disappointing, nonetheless, to Tamir Rice's family. They did not treat the uh, Rice family or Samaria Rice, Tamir's mother, well here. They did not. They didn't communicate their decision. They engaged in a highly irregular process where they apparently overruled the recommendations of career prosecutors. They delayed the decision by months and months and months until the statute of limitations expired, and now it has. Tamir Rice was shot by Cleveland police officer Timothy Lohman in a park in 2014. Tamir had an airsoft gun two officers mistook for a real gun. The attorney for Rice's family received a report from the DOJ that he calls superficial and a whitewash of the incident. Sabod Chandra is particularly angry that he and Tamir's mother learned of the decision from the media and not the DOJ. The New York Times and Washington Post had previously reported that career prosecutors wanted to convene a grand jury, but were overruled by DOJ higher-ups. There's no acknowledgement in there. There's no response to our inquiry about did career prosecutors, as the New York Times and Washington Post reported, did career prosecutors in fact recommend the convening of a grand jury? They don't address that at all. How the Justice Department can't see that an officer who killed a child and claimed that he was shouting out commands from a moving vehicle when his fellow officer says the windows were rolled up on a winter day, how does that story make any sense? How can that story be true? Chandra would like to see obstruction and perjury charges filed against those two police officers. He says once he receives more information from the Department of Justice, he would like to present that information to both the county prosecutor and Ohio's Attorney General. For Law and Crime Daily, I'm Anjanette Levy. 
Expected but disappointing. Dina, one of the reasons the DOJ stated for not pursuing charges was that the video was grainy and the angles on the camera weren't that great. What do you make of that reasoning? I mean, it's true, and that is the problem all along, is that there wasn't very much evidence. So that was why the career prosecutors were trying to convene this grand jury. They wanted to know whether or not the, the police officer had made statements that were basically lies during the investigation. And they were hoping these obstruction charges they could then use to create the civil rights charges that they were ultimately trying to see if they could get. So, and, the, and it took two years before the Department of Justice denied those career prosecutors request. So there's, there is, appears to be this, you know, delay, this appearance of bias, which is really a shame because the whole reason why the Department of Justice got involved was to be an impartial, unbiased second investigation of the local investigation. And yet again, the family and a lot of people feel like justice wasn't served here. Yeah, and those delays affected the case as the, the statute of limitation has passed, as the defense attorney said. Terry, the DOJ said that there was no violation of Rice's rights against unreasonable force and that the officers weren't willful in their violations of his rights. Do you agree? I don't agree. In fact, I agree with Dina here. You know, the system failed Tamar Rice. The fact that the 911 system call was wrong, the local authorities didn't bring charges, the Department of Justice now is not bringing charges. And I go back to the video. It took only two seconds for the police to start shooting. That is not enough time. I think that there was unreasonable force here, and I think that there should be charges brought against these police officers. Exactly. That two seconds was a, was a cry out for many people to bring justice for Tamir Rice. But of course, as we see, that has not happened. Thank you both. Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, why two more officers involved in the Breonna Taylor case will now be fired. But first, a prominent jazz musician says his son was attacked after being falsely accused of stealing an iPhone. Will anyone face charges? Find out after the break. Charges could be coming for a woman who allegedly wrongfully accused a 14-year-old of stealing her iPhone. Grammy Award winner Kenyon Harold filmed the confrontation in the Arlo Hotel lobby. Harold says he and his son were accosted by the woman who insisted that his son stole her iPhone. The woman in the video is heard saying he's, leave he's not leaving until he's proven otherwise. Afterwards, the woman's Uber driver reportedly returned her iPhone. The NYPD says they're considering bringing charges of grand larceny or attempted robbery, a decision that came after viewing the video. This is my phone. Show me. No, you don't have no. to explain nothing to her. Take the case off. That's mine. Literally, get it back, please. Are you kidding me? You feel like there's only one one iPhone made in the world? No. Okay, then show me the. Show no, me all my you get get a life. Over yeah, there. What's on your you Instagram? You better go use find find my iPhone. Go yeah, do that. Find my iPhone is off. Can you on come that right now? No, no, you can't. No. I'm the manager of the hotel. Yes, I don't care. He will. This is right my now. son. Hey, did you see me just come downstairs? By Elevator. I'm trying to help. Man. No, but you're not helping. I what am. you've been is disrespectful. No, I'm trying to settle the no. situation. We, I'm, I'm asking my son to... has nothing to do with her. No. I'm trying to figure yeah, out what's going on. Yeah, but he has my phone. Then show me the oh. proof. No, he's not leaving. Show me the proof. He, are you show me the proof. You better get on. I need oh. you away. Let's go, kid. I need you away. I'm sorry. You better get on. We have what you you see you see two black people. No, I'm not letting him walk away with my phone. The recording ends abruptly, and Harold says he and his son were assaulted. This is what happened. He was definitely assaulted in front of the hotel. In front. I'm a trumpet player, so. Now my hand's bleeding because I'm trying to protect my son because of a crazy person saying she took his iPhone and trying to go into his pocket, trying to go into my pocket. Um, this is unacceptable, unacceptable. On a day when I'm just trying to have a good time with my son, right here. So, unacceptable. Dina, this went beyond a simple mistake. I think at one point, she's saying, take off the case, that's my phone. Uh, what are your thoughts about the potential of her charges here? Well, they have located this woman, so I think she will definitely get charged. And there's assault, a battery, maybe attempted larceny. 
illegal detainment, possibly, because it seems like they're trying to get away and she continues to try to stop them. I mean, it's horrible to watch. Uh, they, so they say, though, in New York said that they may not be being bias charges. I think there should be some sort of bias charges. It's clear here that she's doing, there's some racial undertone here. Now, Terry, I practice here in New York. What I'm seeing here is there's a potential for attempted robbery or grand larceny. These charges could come up to being more than four years in jail. Do you think the charges, though, fit what you've seen and heard so far? Here's what I think. We should throw the book at her. I do think that we should have attempted robbery, grand larceny, false imprisonment. And, you know, this is a biased crime. Until people become accountable for their actions and until the criminal justice systems actually really prosecutes these people and, and give them the maximum amount, I don't think we're going to be able to stop this sort of thing from happening. So once the punishment fits the crime, I think people will think twice about accusing people unfoundedly when they obviously had nothing to do with taking this woman's phone. It was lost. Yeah, and of course, the, the Dina, what did you make of that whole comment, well, the Find My iPhone app, but it was off, and that's point, and that's my phone, that's my phone. I mean, shout out to my mom. When she first heard this, she's like, why didn't anyone just call her number? She would have known that's not her phone. It made no sense. What did you think, Dina? I think oftentimes in these kind of situations, whether or not it has to do with this or, again, with the police shooting that we just saw recently, it doesn't make sense. The circumstances don't make sense unless you allow the fact that there is some racism involved. Because clearly this doesn't make sense. And it doesn't unless you realize that that has to be a motive for her wanting to accuse this perfect stranger in a lobby of a hotel of something like this. Yeah, very bizarre. Thanks for the input, Dina and uh, Terry. When we come back, Louisville police move to fire two detectives involved in the Breonna Taylor case why the police chief is notifying them of the decision 10 months after the deadly raid. The Louisville police chief is now planning to fire two of the officers involved in the deadly warrant on Brianna Taylor's apartment. Chief Yvette Gentry sent a pre-termination letter to the detective who filed for the no-knock warrant. Breonna Taylor was killed in March by police inside her home. Detective Joshua James was notified of violations for failing to complete a search warrant operations plan and lying about contacting a U.S. postal inspector, which he claimed in the warrant that Taylor's ex-boyfriend had been receiving packages at her apartment. Her ex-boyfriend, Jamarcus Glover reportedly hadn't been to her apartment for months. Officers arrested Glover, a convicted drug dealer, 40 minutes before the raid on Taylor's apartment. The chief wrote James had actually received the information about the postal inspector from Sergeant John Mattenly, one of the officers who fired shots in Taylor's apartment. The chief said Mattenly got the information from another officer. Also receiving a pre-termination letter, Detective Miles Cosgroves. Investigators determined Cosgrove fired the bullet that killed Taylor. James and Cosgrove will have the opportunity to appear at an administrative hearing to contest their findings. Terry, in this lie to get the warrant, we haven't heard where it originated from. Mattingly supposedly heard it from another officer. Aren't there criminal charges for lying to a judge to get a warrant? Where are they now? Absolutely. They should bring charges against this police officer if, in fact, this is a lie. I mean, it's bad enough that a woman was killed. They shouldn't have been there. If it had been a mistake, that's horrible. But this is even worse. There was a lie involved. So we should be seeing charges brought against at least Mattingly if, in fact, he was the one who's involved in the lie. And, you know, the really hard part about this case is not one of the officers really has been charged as far as her death is concerned. So it just gets worse, Brian. Exactly. Dina, it appears in Louisville, officers can get fired for lying about a warrant, charged for shooting holes into an apartment, but not charged in the murder of Breonna Taylor. Could this termination change that, though? I think so. There were two very important determinations. One is that there was a lie to the court, which is a fraud to the court. You know, we can get disbarred as lawyers for that. So 
the fact that a police officer for this long was still acting like a police officer after this is actually quite shocking. And there could easily be a perjury charge for that officer, Jane, that was just fired. And the other officer involved, you know, was considered reckless in his shooting. And there's been uh, so many really detailed reenactments and interviews. And the amount of evidence, I think, is just compiling larger. And I think we might see charges against him as well. No, no, Terry, hear me out. This is where I get confused here and quote unquote confused. When my clients step into a situation like a, like a petty larceny or something like that, and one of the people pulls out a knife, everyone's charges get bumped up. So if Officer Matley and Cosgrove lie to get this warrant and someone dies because of it, how come officers' charges can't get risen as well? They should be. You were absolutely right, Brian. I mean, you have to wonder if it's because they are police officers. And obviously, we know that there's some sort of sovereign immunity here, some sort of limited immunity. But the fact is, you know, there are lies involved here, and they should have charges because what occurred to Breonna Taylor, the fact that she was killed, no one has been held accountable for that. And, you know, just so far, we only have charges as they relate to Hankinson, and it has to do with the neighbors for endangering the apartment next door. That's not enough here. This resulted in the death of an individual, and someone needs to pay for that. Yeah. Not only the death of Breonna Taylor, but also these officers put other officers in danger by their own lies. That's reckless endangerment of their colleagues and the innocent people in the home that they raided. We'll, we'll wait to see if charges come up, though, but I wouldn't hold my breath here. When we come back, a wrestler dies after being caught in a rip current in the ocean. His body found days later, why his widow is now suing next. The widow of a WWE star is suing Los Angeles County over his drowning death. Wrestler Sean Gaspar died in May after being caught in a rip current while swimming at Venice Beach with his 10-year-old son. The lawsuit alleges lifeguard saw Gaspard and his son struggling in the water but failed to act quickly. Then, when they did come, the lawsuit accuses them of only helping the child and leaving Gaspar in the water to die. Rescuers at the time told local media that Gaspar told them to save his son first. Crews found his body three days later. Dina... This story really breaks my heart in many ways, but telling the lifeguards to save his son first isn't the first heroic thing Gaspard has done. He also stopped an armed robbery in Florida back in 2016, but my question here is, is the fact that he told the lifeguards to save his son first, could that affect his civil case? I mean, it's possible. I think this is going to be a very hard case for him to prove. Unfortunately, you know, the Pacific Ocean is known for surfing, right? So our waves here are very dangerous. And we often have a lot of riptides. And I remember actually that weekend because it was right around the time that the stay-at-home order lifted and people were allowed to visit the beaches again. And it happened to correspond with very difficult riptides. And so I, there were quite a few of rescues around that time. And so unfortunately, we do have um, occasional drowning in the L.A. area. And our L.A. County department is known for the one of their fastest response times for the life department. So I, the lifeguards, I think this is going to be very difficult for him to prove. I have seen them rescue more than one person at a time in the ocean. So my guess is that they were probably far apart. Otherwise, I think they probably would have rescued both the son and him at the same time, just from my you know knowledge of kind of how they tend to operate here. But this is going to be hard for them to prove because, like I said, they have a very good reputation. They encounter this kind of thing, unfortunately, quite a bit. Dina, thank you for both your expertise in the courts and in the waters. Uh, in other news in the sporting world, a former Olympic boxer has been charged in the murder of his daughter. 25-year-old Ola Samal's body was found in a park in Staten Island, New York, last year. She was known for volunteering at a domestic violence shelter for Muslim women and children. After her death, her father, Kabari Salam, told the New York Times she had told him about being followed by someone on the highway. But now, more than a year later, police say her father strangled her, dragged her body into the woods, and covered it with branches. Officials say Salam left the country after her death and was extradited from Kuwait. Terry, I know you felt outraged when you heard this story. Tell us why. 
You know, Brian, that's right. I felt really that this case is just so difficult to understand. It's disturbing because a child is supposed to trust their parent. And here we have a father who is powerful in strength, and he allegedly strangled his daughter, and then he tried to conceal her body. He lied about the fact that someone might have been following her when he knew, apparently, all along, that he was the one who actually killed her. And, you know, according to the reports, Brian, there was a restraining order issued against him. So we know that there were some issues with the family and as far as the relationship was concerned between the father and the daughter. So I also am disturbed because they did not follow up with that to make sure that she was safe. And, you know, at the end of the day, the irony is she worked at a women's domestic violence shelter. So she helped other women who had to deal with domestic violence. And so here she is dying in a violent way at the hands of her own father. I mean, it's really heartbreaking. We know that we can't bring back someone's life, but the hope is that her life and memory continue to protect other women in her situation. Terry and Dina, thank you very much. And thank you for joining us here at Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.